Non-fungible token. I kept wanting to say N for network, as in network fungible token, but it's non-fungible tokens. And, you know, uh, we're not trying to give Nuvayak uh, a conniption fit, but this is another example of that blockchain stuff. And, you know, I thought, Nuvayak, you made some great points in our salon earlier this week that part of the problem with blockchain is it doesn't acknowledge the role of Bitcoin as an infrastructure. And maybe that's something we'll get into today. But the rise of NFTs... I mean, it's a way of leveraging the authentication capabilities of blockchain technologies, the authentication capabilities of Bitcoin and Ethereum. And this is the article that got a, a lot of the attention this week. And it was all about how a 10 second video clip ended up being sold for $6.6 .6 million dollars. And it's not just art clips, it's real estate, it's... Uh, you know, concept. I mean, it's it's confusing, and I wanted to take uh, today's show as an opportunity to look into this because it's not just NFTs; it's crypto art, it's virtual real estate, and you know, this is where I have to give some credit to Merlatron, who is one of our correspondents here on the Cyberpunk Now show, but of course, is one of the pillars of the MetaViews network. And Merlatron, you know, even before this news was starting to pick off, uh, Merlatron was like, you know, hey, we got to do a segment on uh, this NFTs and crypto art. And uh, in particular, Merlatron, you were talking about the uh, uh, virtual worlds or what I'm calling virtual real estate. But before we get to that, why don't you give us our, your intro on kind of what we're... we're what is NFTs and why is it blowing up now? Like, why do people care about this stuff all of a sudden? Yeah, uh, well, I actually, uh, so I, I think when I first heard about it was uh, probably to do with uh, Beeple, uh, Beeple Crap on Instagram, uh, who is a well-known 3D artist um, doing his art drop uh, of an NFT non-fungible token artwork or, or a collection of them um and how people made 3.5 million dollars on in a single weekend from selling his nft artworks and so I, I started looking into this more and um you know basically my understanding of it is nfts are really just an identifier for a type of uh, for a digital asset um the idea behind them being this can empower artists. Um, this can sort of, you know, uh, in, in this in the same way, you know, blockchain, uh, the, all the hype around it is getting away from the banks. The hype around NFTs, uh, I see, is getting away from the gatekeepers of art. Um, mm -hmm. You know, being able to to own your art and and sell it and continue to make a profit off it. So a, a big part of uh, these is that NFTs can have royalties programmed in. Um, for instance, I believe on these ones, uh, people had a 10% royalty. Um, and so that as they get sold in secondary markets, um, he's going to get some of that money. And as the price goes up, he'll, he'll, continue to, to earn off of that. So one of the earliest ones, uh, it sounds like, because uh, this uh, sort of all started in 2017, actually, and that was the CryptoPunks. Um, and just recently, uh, one of the rarer CryptoPunks, which are just these uh, 24 by 24 pixel art uh, characters, um, which there are 10,000 of, they're algorithmically generated. Uh, and one of the rarer ones, the CryptoPunks Aliens, recently sold for 605 Ethereum, which is equivalent to, at the time, 760,000 US dollars. And it's, you know, it, now, it's, it's fascinating. If I could just quickly interrupt. Yeah. Well, and, and it strikes me from a technical perspective, part of this is authentication, right? Part of this is proving that the art is legit and not a knockoff and not a fake. 
But the other side is you're creating artificial scarcity, right? You're right. taking what is a digital medium that has zero scarcity because you can copy and create an infinite amount of copies, but instead you're limiting the amount of copies and therefore creating scarcity and therefore creating a potential increase in value the same way that you know Bitcoins have a limited amount in circulation this allows for a limited amount of copies of, in this case, digital art. Right. And yeah, it is sort of the whole, uh, the idea of the collectible. Um, and, you know, that there's only one. Uh, and, and, you know, all of these, uh, these different sites, like for instance, Super Rare, which is sort of one of the more prominent ones, uh, or Rareable, which is another one. They're all capitalizing on this idea of rarity um and, and the collectible nature now what i find interesting is that uh you know as some artists have pointed out it's you know you can so for instance if i just go on super rare here <laughs> and, and go to the market um you know these are, are owned by someone in theory but you know i can still right click and save this image so it's not that you know the image is necessarily inaccessible or you can't access it, but it's really just as this person puts it, you know, an entry in a fancy database asserting that you own the artwork. And, right, which and has two different assumptions to it. One, that there's status with that, right? Like part of, you know, the whole thing of having a Pablo Picasso in your home is it's a status symbol that says you're a badass because you've got a Pablo Picasso in your home. But on the same side, it is an investment, right? You're anticipating that this art will go up in value. So you're putting money into this tangible asset, especially in a time period of economic volatility in the hopes that it will go higher than investing in Google stock or investing in real estate or investing in an excavator. But to your point, it also puts a lot of assumptions, or dare I say it, faith in copyright and in intellectual property. The idea that in the future, we're still going to respect that shit. And, and that's what kind of uh, uh, flummoxes me or, or confuses me a little. But I, I think that's partly what you're getting at, correct? Yeah, it's, uh, it, it does seem to be a lot of faith. Um, you know, you really have to believe in the system <laughs> backing this up. To, to be able to, uh, you know, you know, want to invest money in this significant amounts of money. Um, and, and people are doing that. So for instance, the, the crypto punk I brought up earlier, uh, you know, $700,000. And I believe that was purchased by this collective, uh, which is basically what I see as a NFT hedge fund, in a sense, yeah. or, or equity, where they're investing well, in these these nfts um and because i mean the, the first question the first question that comes up that i think we're gonna have to address in a future episode is who are the buyers right like you know who are the people fueling this market and fueling this craze and that's where i gotta push back merely and and this isn't your fault you're just you know repeating the language that you're reading but i don't think we should be using the word dollars Right. Like these are transactions that are happening in Ether or these are transactions that are happening in some type of token, depending on the marketplace. And I think it's a false assumption to assume that people are instantly cashing out. Right. right. Because the way in which the cryptocurrency world, there's a lot of speculation. And to your point, if there's a hedge fund, they're investing in this art, not just as a vote of confidence in the art, but as a vote of confidence in Ether and Ethereum and a vote of right. confidence in the currency that they're amassing, right? And it goes back to Ken's point in Tuesday Salon that if you're a robber, why rob a bank? Why rob these NFTs? Go after whoever has the Ethereum wallet and rob them and take their Ether or go after whoever has the Bitcoin wallet and steal their Bitcoins, right? And, and that's where... I feel that the language and narrative around this is still too simplistic 
to allow us to understand what's going on. But allow me to use this interruption to also share uh, one example that I wanted to bring up, which made me a little skeptical about this whole situation. You know, this is uh, uh, from Money Lab, which is a, a group of European intellectuals, partly facilitated by Geert Lovink, who's an internet scholar I've been following for decades. And this was written by his friend Rosa Menkman. And Rosa Menkman is an internet artist and digital artist. And, you know, here Rosa talks about kind of crypto art. But her point is that she found her art on NFT markets. This was art, digital art that she had created that were uploaded and converted into these blockchains without her consent and without her knowledge. So it kind of speaks to the, you know, the, for lack of a better word, the sort of non-consensual nature of the NFT marketplace that apparently digital artists are having their digital art put into these markets. Other people are selling that art based on its uniqueness and the artist has no idea that this is going on. Mm -hmm. So it's a whole other level of not so much counterfeiting because you're taking a digital art, you're turning it into a scarce object. I'm not sure the word counterfeit no longer applies, but it's still exploitative. It's still taking sure. advantage of a creator and not compensating in a way that they ought to be compensated, which to me speaks to stuff that Nuvayak has been critical of blockchains in terms of it promises this notion of integrity, but it's a false notion of integrity because the integrity could still be fraudulent in the first place. For sure. And I, I think that's definitely one of the problems is, you know, the idea that you don't have to necessarily own an artwork to upload it and claim it as your own. There's there's not a, a system there to verify that. Um, and I think a lot of these platforms that have done this have had problems with copyright and, and authenticity. Another problem which I'll bring up is the environmental impact. Because, uh, you know, there's all this hype around these, these technologies. And, you know, so for instance, this artist is bringing up uh, how they were going to be doing a drop, the same as people on, on Nifty Gateway, the same platform. And then they, they decided to stop that because of the massive amounts of energy that it takes to run these. Um, they have stated here that, you know, the, uh, the, I believe it was, yes, um, like 10 seconds of, uh, right, sorry, in 10 seconds, they consumed more electricity than the entire studio over the past 10, two years, which is ridiculous. Like that's not sustainable at all. <laughs> um, and they, they go into talking about how, uh, there are ways to reduce these emissions, but it, it kind of speaks to the, the, how new this, this technology is, how new these platforms are and how, while they're exciting for the reasons of, of, you know, giving artists this opportunity to, to own their own work and, and make money off of it. There are a lot of problems like what you're saying with the copyright, uh, and especially the environmental impact, I think is a big one. Well, and, and to your earlier point that uh, many of these technologies are meant as disintermediation, right? As trying to get around existing gatekeepers. And I think if anything, this is illustrating the absurdity that the entire art world centers around rich people, centers around a tiny amount of rich people who use art as a combination of money laundering, right? And, and a way of, of hoarding wealth, of locking up value into rare objects. And this is just artists trying to get an end run around gallery owners and brokers to try to get access to those rich people. But in the case of someone like Grimes, right, who is living and has is the mother of the child of one of the richest people in the world. You know, when she releases stuff on this, it, she isn't trying to make money. It's quite the opposite. It's that people want access to her and access to money in terms of trying to speculate on the rise of this property. So mm -hmm. it, it all seems kind of corrupt and obscene to me. I mean, I want to 
quickly bring Nuviak into this discussion where, you know, they're saying that the NFT thing comes up every few years on the blockchain and it's bullshit. What happened to everyone's counterparty tokens? You know, it's very simple. A token represents something else. Hmm. Bitcoin tokens represent Bitcoins, right? The kind of circular nature of these types of systems. And if he also points out that NFTs don't need the proof of work from Bitcoin since they are inherently centralized, gallery owners and brokers provide a function. Whether people think their rates are fair or not is a different matter. A very valid point, Nuviak. And our pal Dufus Tumish points out, to bring the indigenous voice in the room, the context of authenticity needs to be at the forefront. Great discussion and love that Nuviak is bringing brutal truth and FYI, if I pitch this to my artist friends, they would paddle his ass out the door. <laughs> well said, Doofus Tumish. Absolutely. And that's why I kind of feel that this is all hype. Really designed, not for artists, not for the art world, but for rich people. And people who want to con rich people. Which, in the latter, I'm all in favor of that. Let, let's have open source discussions on how to con rich people. But, you know, Merlitron, the interesting part of this conversation for me was uh, not so much the art, but the kind of virtual real estate or the virtual worlds and the way in which people were using uh, NFTs or non-fungible tokens as a way to extend property speculation into the digital world and anticipate the kind of virtual worlds, whether it's virtual reality or augmented reality or some evolution of the web, that they almost want to kind of rush out and stake that and turn it into private property. And that's where, you know, to Doofus Tumish's point about the importance of authenticity when it comes to art, you know, maybe there's something to be said about there's no such thing as private property and this is all communal property and that the web should be regarded as communal property. Not to presume where this conversation is going to go, but, you know, Merlitron, I'm, I'm curious as you extend our field trip here into the world of NFT, you know, what can you tell us about the rise of virtual real estate and the way in which people are using this technology to kind of to engage in digital property speculation when it comes to virtual worlds? Uh, well, that's certainly something I've been interested in. And, you know, one of these uh, more prominent ones is Decentraland, which is essentially a, a VR world. Uh, where I believe it was 300 by 300 parcels of land. Uh, so it is, again, kind of rare and, and limited. Um, and as you're saying, you know, there are people, so for instance, this article talks about how there's a guy named Maddie who, if you want some real estate in Decentraland, he's the guy to talk to because he has a huge portfolio of all these parcels of land Um and, you know, in theory, he's making quite a bit of money off them. Um, again, it's quite speculative. Uh, and there are, uh, there's a bunch of discussion on how of all the fallacies of this world. You know, people are trying to create this second society. I kind of find it all ridiculous, again, because of this whole, uh, uh, the, the environmental impact and the fact that, you know, if we have people living in the second society and everyone else outside of the society is going to be suffering the consequences of that environmental impact. It seems a little heinous, but there's also uh, this notion of, um, you know, this Decentraland being entirely decentralized. They talk about how this is a, a game where you can implement gambling because they're not bound by the laws of uh, their, uh, you well. know, whatever country. In theory. Yeah, so they falsely believe, <laughs> right. right? And and so they are engaging in fraud by, you know, cou counseling people otherwise. And th and this is always, you know, both the corruption and, and the con at the same time. That the corruption is, you know, like anyone who holds a lot of land, they need to create the perception of value that that land is worth something. So they need to create these myths. They need to create this idea when maybe that land should not be privately owned in the first place. That maybe if there is such a thing as cyberspace, it's our imagination. And maybe it's immoral to suggest that someone should own your imagination. Because if I imagine a virtual world, 
Who can own that? Arg I shouldn't even be able to own that. Who like my imagination is arguably a collective imagination because it reflects all the culture and uh, anyway, I digress. But it strikes me, you know, that was my point about the corruption, that if you have a real estate developer, that real estate developer needs to create a mechanism by which they can get a return on their investment. But the con is that they're assuming that this is going to be the future, right? That they're assuming that the future is going to be this particular virtual world and not like my current hypothesis is it's going to be Minecraft. That there's going to be like a meta Minecraft. That someone's going to create a Minecraft protocol to stitch together all the Minecraft servers in the world. I mean, maybe not, but that seems far more viable than Decentraland or some other kind of make-believe idea that someone made up. I, I mean, I'm curious, Merle, what are your thoughts in terms of some of the other virtual real estate stuff that you're seeing? Yeah, well, I mean, I think to your point, so there's this other one, Somnium Worlds, which kind of props itself up as a VR metaverse. And, you know, you can see the reviews are mixed. <laughs> and that's because, you know, the top comment here is, okay, so I wanted to try the game. The world is barren with nothing from the gameplay relevant functionality implemented. Graphics are super janky. Um, he goes into the Discord server, and the dev all the developers seem to be interested in is patting each other's backs and monetization. And, you know, they're basically trying to squeeze money out of people with things like property taxes, and there's no free-to-play functionality planned. It's all behind a paywall. All the positive re reviews seem to sort of be buying into this hype, uh, who are, are sort of like, oh, this is going to be revolutionary. This is the next big thing uh, is this metaverse of, of, you know, where everyone's going to be playing. But, you know, a as a lot of people have observed, it it's all hype. <laughs> you know, there's at most a few people you can interact with in this world. Uh, like we were talking about before, people have bought up all the land. Um, and it's all based on this speculation of this idea that, you know, this is going to be a big thing. Cause in reality, as lots of people are saying, it's just a shitty game. <laughs> like they haven't put the effort in to make it a, a, a kind of somewhere you might want to actually spend as a second life. Um, and, and, well, you know, and, and not to mention that the whole concept of the metaverse is that it expands on it through its own gravity, through its own accord that just like the internet, anyone create a web server, right? Anyone can take a machine and connect it to the internet. And by extension, the internet is larger, it's grown. But if you're suggesting that the metaverse is something you have to pay admission for, right? That is contained in some type of limited way, then it ain't the metaverse by definition. It's not even a verse. It's just some walled garden. Yeah. And, and I think it is quite a bit of, you know, just a cash grab in a lot of ways and, and based on speculation, you know, we, for instance, this is the Somnium marketplace and you've got this uh, parcel of land here going for 10 Ethereum, which, you know, in theory is around uh, $15,000 in theory. Uh, and uh, it just all seems ridiculous the like, another thing that was brought up is you know the creators of uh, going back to decentraland they want the landholders to be the ones who make the decision so they're trying to take this position of neutrality where you know they're they're not going to impose any kind of government um and but they just did that right go yeah. ahead well and it, you know it brings up these issues of like well what if all the owners of property in decentraland are fascists <laughs> what if they're all bigots and, you know, this this second society is entirely made up of maybe people who shouldn't be controlling this metaverse um, and, and but that's the point. there's this lack of diversity. That is, but that's the point. As soon as they assert that, you know, the landowner should be the ones with power, well, that's called neo-feudalism. Right. Like that, you know, that that we that already exists as a political system. And that's mm -hmm. exactly what breeds the kind of authoritarianism and bigotry that, you know, history, unfortunately, has demonstrated. And, you know, it's interesting where we've run out of time. But I mean, what I've enjoyed about this segment is it both it cuts 
uh, into the hype. It cuts sort of through the hype of the NFT world and the virtual real estate and whatnot. But I think what's great about this Merlitron is it provides us a kind of frame by which to look at this in the future. Because, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, when the Bitcoin hype first got started, while I recognized that it would play a valuable role in terms of the, you know, Internet's infrastructure, I, I did not anticipate the speculative bubble that, that it would also cause. And I think this NFT stuff, even though it's easy for us to look at it as just hype and, you know, a power grab, I, I do think that it's going to have legs in terms of I think it's going to attract a lot of people who have been primed by the pandemic to get into the the, the gambling that is uh, investing and the gambling that is the stock market. And this just provides another means by which to gamble, especially for people who have found success in cryptocurrency markets who are not yet in a position to cash out that cryptocurrency, but feel a desire to kind of keep the game moving and, and, and find other things to play. So, I mean, finally, Merlitron, like, what do you think we should be keeping an eye on moving forward in terms of how this NFT stuff is going to play out? Uh, you know, is, is there, do you think the virtual real estate is going to be dominant? Do you think it's going to be the art stuff? I mean, you know, what's the thing, again, very briefly, that we should be uh, really paying attention to? I mean, I think these are all interesting things to be paying attention to. Um, I feel like the, one of the the bigger spaces in this is going to be the art. Um, I think a, a lot of the VR worlds is a lot of hype and that those are going to die off relatively quickly. Uh, there will always be the the dedicated ones who stick with it. But I, I think it is interesting uh, from the perspective of digital artists uh, trying to make a buck and get around these, these gatekeepers uh, and that that's what I'm going to be focusing on um, going forward.